Okay. Welcome to the last talk of this afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce Anna Rechman from Mathematics Institute in Mexico City. And she will talk about asymptotic imbalance for flows on three manifolds. Well, th um, thank you for coming and thank you for the invitation. And I, I mean, Pepe, one of the things that was in the invitation mail was please try to talk about something that is in collaboration with French people. So this is work in pro progress with Pierre Dornois. The, of Grenoble, and I will, I will try to be as general as I can and talk about what we did at the end. So the problem, the problem I will be addressing is you have a three manifold, any three manifold. If you don't want to think of a difficult manifold, maybe just a three sphere. Then you have a vector field any vector field that moves something, not trivial. And then I'm going to assume that the flow always preserves some volume form, just to make things simple. OK? And there are many, 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 many examples of this. And what you want to, what the problem we want to study somehow is we want to give to this problem some quantity that is invariant under diffeomorphisms that preserve the volume form. So that if I have two flows that are conjugated, this quantity stays the same. OK? And there are many ways of doing so, but not so many. That's what I want you to convince you. And at the end, I will tell you one way we did it. OK? So one of the main motivations for this is the Euler equation. So I think I, I already lost my grandmother. <laughs> but anyway, the Euler equation is a partial differential equation that is quite simple. If you have, so we will, in general, we'll write just x I, I always think of, because, I don't know, because I started like this because the way I was formed, I think of autonomous vector fields, but this works for non-autonomous vector fields. So the other equation, you have a non-autonomous vector field, and what you want is that when you take, sorry. This is the gradient of some function. OK, so you take the differential of, of the vector fields with respect to time. Then you take, you subtract the cross product of the rotational of the vector field with the vector field. And that has to give you a gradient. Okay. What? Check. F is some function. It's something related with the pressure. But I'm, no, I, I Normally, when I see this kind of equations, I, I'm scared. I'm not. Partial differential equations, sorry. <laughs> Something scary for me. <laughs> Especially that one. <laughs> but anyway, but, but there's, there's something very nice about this equation that was observed by Helmholtz in 1858. <laughs> Um, so this, again, I think my grandmother will understand the next few things I'm going to say. So what Hamlet observed is that the rotational is preserved. So the rotational, for those that don't do dynamical systems in three dimensions, or don't remember the calculus classes, the rotational, what measures is if you fix a point in your vector field, if your flow is moving everything, and you have a fixed point, and you look a very small sphere around that point, and you s that sphere is, I'm not allowing it to move, but it can rotate. 
Okay? And when it rotates, it will define an axis of rotation and a direction of rotation. And that's the rotational vector field. So it's directed in the axis, and it, has this, the me it measures how much you rotate in time. Okay? So when you have a non-autonomous vector field, well, you will get a rotational that depends on time, so it's changing. But what helps us observe is that if you want to know the rotational at time t, the only thing you need to know is the rotational at time zero and then push it with the flow. Okay? So the observation here is that the rotational at time t is the image of the rotational at time zero where this is the flow of my equation. And I assume that there is a solution, okay? So this, this gave, so then Maxwell read this paper, and Maxwell decided that this was the way to understand the elements, okay? So this gave, so what's, what's happening here? So if you want to, you take this, this vector field and you want to give it something that is invariant. Well, one thing that is invariant is if you have a periodic orbit of the rotational at time zero. It will stay periodic at any time. It will move around, but it will be always be a periodic orbit. It will always be an orbit of the rotational at time t. So somehow it's an invariant of this flow, this periodic orbit. Okay, so what Helfel said, what, well, what Maxwell said is, well, maybe the elements are all the knot types that we can have as periodic orbits. And we, because there was a theory of plasma, and so we believed that plasma was everything, and, and so he started saying, well, maybe we can classify elements if we can classify knots. And they build, so Max, Maxwell and Tate build, build a machine that made rings of smoke in shapes of knots. And these rings have shown, so one of the things that is behind this equation is that for small times, these rings will be preserved. So you see, what, like when smokers make a ring, it's preserved for some time. I mean, this equation is not really the good equation to model that, but somehow it models a little bit of it, okay? And so basically this observation started knot theory because then Maxwell told Tate to make table knots and then tables of knots, and then we got all these classifications of knots and blah, blah. And some, some of the things I'm going to say later is how now we are using knot theory to build invariants for flows. Okay? So, so what I was saying, I want to build invariants for this thing on their volume preserving diffeomorphisms, and one of the motivation is this, because if I have such a quantity, and then I apply it to the rotational of the solution of the Euler equation, I get something that is invariant for the solution of the Euler equation, because this flow, or this diffeomorphism of time t is a diffeomorphism that preserves volume. So one of the motivations to build invariants for flows on three dimension on the volume different volume preserving diffeomorphisms is to find invariants for these equations. Okay? There is if you if you look at the simplest equation in mag magnetodynamics, there is an analog to this thing. So that's that's part of the motivation. Okay? So so I think I was not very clear. So what I wanted to say is if I want to give you if you tell me Give me one, one invariant for this equation, then one invariant is a knot type of a periodic orbit of the rotation. But not very useful, okay? So the first example that I'm going to spend a little bit of time ex trying to explain is helicity. So helicity was introduced in the 20th century was quite studied by Moffat and Arnold, among others. And there's many ways of defining it. Let me start writing one of them. So one thing you can do is to 
integrate over m the dot product between your vector field and a vector potential. So what it means, some vector field whose rotational is a vector field you gave me at the beginning. Okay, instead of just building the rotational, I go back. Okay, and you integrate this with respect to the volume and you get some number. Okay, and this is invariant. And I will now write a new formula and you will see more easily that it's invariant. So another way to define this is integral of alpha wedge d alpha, where d alpha equals the contraction of the volume form by the vector field. So this is a two form that is close because I am assuming the vector field to preserve volume and I will assume that it's also exact. So this is obviously the case, it's exact. For example, if M is a three sphere, but it can be exact, I mean it can, some, sometimes it's exact maybe, even if the homologies are not zero. But anyway, so you, you integrate this. So I don't know which one of the two you are more familiar with. I'm more familiar with the bottom one. So, so then you see, so the first thing you can tell me is there's some choice there. You choose the alpha, okay? Well, it, it's, the integral is independent of the choice. So it, it's an easy, it's, it's just a line that you have to write. And also it's, it's more easily seen that it's invariant under diffeomorphisms that preserve omega. Okay, so this is the first invariant. And it's, it's nice, it's easily computable. Um, and the question is what is telling you about the flow? And that's the theorem of Arnold. So I will try not to raise my knot because I'm very bad at drawing knots on the blackboard. So. So a theorem by Arnold with there were some not mistakes but things that were not correctly written in the proof by Arnold so it was corrected by Thomas Vogel that tells you that the holicity Vector field is the asymptotic linking number. Okay, so how, how you define this thing? So I will write and then I will explain to you. So the thing is you integrate So you take two points in your manifold, any two points, x and y. Then you choose two times, t1 and t2. And you follow each of these points for a time t1, one for a time t1 and the other one for a time t2. And they do something. You get two long curves, normally not closed, and then you close them. And how you close them? Well, you just put a geodesic. And then you prove that this gives you two simple, for almost all pair of points and almost all T1 and T2, as in dynamical systems, as you were saying, you get two simple curves that don't, do not intersect. And so you can compute their linking number. So you compute how much they are linked. Okay, so I don't know if you know, you count, I mean, if you have a diagram like that, they are obviously not linked because I put one and then the other, but if they were linked, you count minus and plus one for each one, and that gives you a number. 
that is this number in here. Okay? Then you divide by t1 and t2, and you take the limit when t1 and t2 tend to infinity. Okay? And there's something to do. You have to prove that that limit exists. Not, it's not extremely difficult, but you do it. Okay? And that gives you a number. And now you want it not to depend from the two points you choose, so you integrate with respect to the with respect to x and then to respect to y on your three manifold. Okay? And there is something very important to notice here that I wrote as three. It's because this is this theorem is valid just for simply connected manifolds. Okay? In other words, it doesn't depend on how you connect the curves. It doesn't depend. So that was a mistake in Arnold's proof. But it's also well defined for any homology three-sphere. It's also defined for any homology three-sphere. But I put the three-sphere because I'm trying to do a simple talk. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so this is this is so so there is some topological aspect to it, and I, I will come back to later for that. And this is somehow d invariant. If you want to build invariants, this is d invariant. So let me tell you why I say that this is d invariant. So you can once once. I mean, once you have this theorem, you you want to do basically this with any not invariant. You, you give me a not invariant, whatever you choose. You take a point, you take the time that gives you a not, you compute it and you take the limit. If the limit exists, you integrate, that gives you a number, great. And it should be invariant, okay? So that game was, 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 played by some people. So, so there's, there's a paper by Friedman and E that do the same for the crossing number. So the crossing number, you do exactly the same. You take two points, you do your two curves. But instead of count, counting the intersections in the projections with plus or minus signs, you just count pluses. Okay, and that gives you another number, and it gives you a new a new invariant. This is a new isentropic invariant. Then there is a work by Gambodoregis. And they did this with the signature of a knot. This is a more complicated invariant. Well, it turns out that if you do it with the signature of a knot, it's quite technical to prove that the limit exists. And once you do it, you find out that what you get is two times the helicity. Okay, and then there are two papers one by Sebastian Bader, another one by Marché and Bader. They use, they do the same game with some type of Basile of invariant, and they get the helicity. I don't know, five times the helicity or something like that. I don't have the number. So they do it with Basile of invariant. It's something proportional okay so it seems that it's a little bit more difficult to get something Do all of these involve two paths? no no they don't these don't involve two paths they just involve one okay but nothing with more than two paths no, I think, well, for the helicity, there's people that have worked with more than two paths. Okay, but I, I don't really know the results. Yes? So you have to talk about it. 
this yeah that's what I want to say is that this one is not proportional to holistic okay but anyway so so it seems that it's not so easy to get new ones and actually there's there's two preprints from last year that prove that if when you play this game you get something that is sufficiently regular in some sense, then you will get the helicity. Okay? So I, I have to copy the last name because I don't Preprints from from 2016 that I mean, with hypotheses that I don't want to explain now, they tell you well if you build an environment that satisfies this, it will be proportional to helicity. Okay, and there are different hypotheses, so they are quite similar but but different hypotheses. The two papers. Okay, so how how, how I'm doing? I still have 10 minutes. Or so. So, so before I, I leave the helicity, let me tell you one nice thing about the helicity. And then I, I will talk about what we did. So, so there's, there's something that you can measure about the vector field, and it's, it's energy. And you just integrate, now I will put S3 everywhere. You just integrate the norm square of your vector field, or if you don't want square, you can, well, you can decide which energy you want, if L1 or whatever. So one, one, one thing you can do is, well, I'm, I'm trying to study vector fields up to volume preserving diffeomorphism. So a question is, can I make the energy small? And how small can I make it? Okay? And the helicity bounds you below the energy. So let me exp give you, I mean, the proof that the helicity bounds the energy will be shorter than what I'm going to explain, but this is somehow the topological reason why it's not working. So you can, Consider two knotted tori, solid tori, okay? Imagine that your vector field is here outside, and here you get, you have some suspension, okay? If you want to make the energy of this vector field very small by a volume preserving diffeomorphism, what you want to do is to make the tori fat, very fat as fat as you can, so that the vector field will get very, very small. Okay, short, the, the tori, you will make them short and fat because you're doing it volume preserving. But you cannot do it forever because there's the other torus that is explained. And the helicity is doing this because the helicity of X will be something like the linking of the tori times the flux in the first torus times the flux in the other terms, okay? And the flux is how much volume is passing through any disk. See, so Saituka suspension is independent of the disk, okay? So, so this is somehow the topological thing below, behind telling you that the helicity is bounding the energy. So now I just will spend the So what we, we define is a new invariant 
call that we call the trunk. It's vector field. And it's based on an invariant for a knot, so it's called the trunk of a knot. And the trunk of a knot is defined in this way. The trunk of a nut. So you, suppose you have a trunk, uh, no, sorry, a, a nut in S3, and I will consider a function that has only two singularities, and all level sets are spheres. Okay, and then the level sets will, at some point, intersect my nut. Well, I will ask this intersection, I mean, I will ask that when you restrain the function to the knot, you get a Morse function. So you have just a finite number of singularities. Okay, so the picture looks like this. So you have here, I will, my spheres will be planes, the two spheres. So you have your level sets. And you have some number of points of intersections. And this will be a singularity, but you could only have a finite number of levels that will contain points like this. Okay? So you define the trunk of a knot k as a minimum among all the height functions. So a height function will be, from now on, one function on S3 that has two singularities and all level sets are spheres. Of the maximum among the t's, let's say in zero, I mean, let's say that our functions take values between zero and one, of the number of intersections between the notch and h minus one of t. Okay. This is how it's defined it for vector for nuts. And now if you want to define it for vector fields. Well, this is the way we did it. Let me see what I put in my notes. So the trunk of a vector field with respect to volume form. Whether the flow, I'm assuming that the flow preserves the volume as at the beginning of the talk that is no longer there, will be the infimum over the height functions. And I will make this clear little by little. Of the maximum over the t in 0, 1. And obviously, I cannot count intersection points. I have a flow, so I have orbits everywhere. Of the flux. of x in h minus 1 of t. So this is the infimum over the height functions, the maximum over the t's of the integral on h minus 1 of t of the absolute value of ax of minus. So let me, so here I, I will put a tilt. So the flux measures, as I was telling you, the flux, what it measures is how much volume crosses, like, in infinitesimal time, your surface. Okay? So if you have a volume-preserving vector field and you put a sphere and you measure how much volume is passing, the answer is zero, because it's, something is passing positive and something is passing negative. So what I want is to count it all positive. Okay? So, so here, that's why I put a tilde, and here is why I put an absolute value. Okay? And this gives you a number. And it turns out to be an invariant. Okay? So there's two minutes, so I will just tell you what we know about this thing and what we don't know. 
What? For not invariant. It's a not invariant, yeah. Because taking the minimum among height functions is is the same as fixing the function and changing the not up to isotopy. Okay. Pues yo le puse tronco. Pero yo le puse. Así que si lo quieres cambiar. <laughs> Okay, so one, one thing we, we do know is that this thing is not the holicity. So it's not proportional to holicity. The reason that we know is because we actually can compute it in some simple examples and we'll get something that is clearly not proportional to helicity. How about the crossing invariant? The what? The crossing invariant. The crossing invariant is not proportional to helicity either. Ah, what? What's so what? So if you, if you compare it with the crossing invariant, Oh, ah. we don't know. We don't know if, no, so it won't be, I, I don't think it will be, I, but I don't know. For sure, I don't know, but I don't think. So, okay. Well, I won't think about that right now. One thing we know is that the, the trunk is, is, is somehow continuous. I won't make this precise. I mean, if you take vector fields that are converging C1 that preserve I mean, you can define it not only for volume forms, but for measures, and then you have measures that converge in, in the weak sense to another one. What you get is the limit of the trunks, okay? So, so this is continuous, but the reason I want to put it is that at least if you have an ergodic flow, this, this does look like an asymptotic invariant, okay? So if, if, if x is ergodic, Then when you compute the trunk of the knot given by following a point for a very long time and closing that curve that gives you a knot, you compute the trunk and then you use the right measure for it. <laughs> you close it. Yeah, close it as you want. You can. This is a trunk of a nut. So okay, maximum and minimum doesn't matter. No, doesn't matter. So this, I mean, this is basically equal to to the trunk of some vector field concentrated on on the nut. And I'm going to write like this with a measure concentrated on the nut. And this will converge to the trunk of your vector field with your garlic measure. Okay? So it has some asymptotic filling to it. Okay? And the other thing we, we proved is that I, I was talking all the time about things that are invariant on their diffeomorphisms that preserve volume, but you could also ask are there invariant on their homeomorphisms that preserve volume? We don't know for the helicity if it's invariant under homeomorphisms that preserves volume. That's a big question. But this one is invariant under homeomorphisms that preserve volume. Okay? So I think uh, I will stop there. Any questions? So, so the, uh, this Euler equation is essentially the geodesic flow in the group of diffeomorphisms, right? So right. Equal. Uh, this invariance, what do they say about this geodesic flow? Do you have any idea about this? No, I don't, I don't have an idea. I mean, for, for the moment, I mean, one of the problems of the crossing number on, of this invariant is that it's very difficult to compute. So for the moment, we know how to compute it in. Because why they, they really want to solve in example. the DS-Tox equation. Yeah, of course. But actually, <laughs> the equation, so 
you get sufficient invariant maybe. Yeah, that's that's one of the ideas. That's the idea of Denis Sullivan. That's Denis Sullivan's idea, yeah. Okay. But okay. yes. Okay. Does that mean that the trunk is not a Vasilian invariant? Yeah, it's not I I think it's not. But that Yeah, I mean I'm not a not theorist, but I think it's not. The trunk was introduced by Osawa and it's a generalization of the width of a knot that is more known that was introduced by Gabay. And there are many there are many relations between one and the other. The difference the the, the width is the average. You sum all the possible regular values from your height function. And here you take the maximum. So, but I think it's not a Vasilev invariant. It's much weaker than the Vasilev invariant. I think but so, the yeah. Invariant is it the gives the you everything. The universal. So. But I'm not an expert in this. So. Ah. So what, what kind of numbers do you get in your computation? So, for example, one. I mean, one easy computation is you take you take a flow in S3, you, not the half vector field, but you preserve two orbits, and then in, in each torus you, you take something that has some slope. Okay. If you compute the helicity of that, you get, let's say the slope is P over Q, uh -huh. you will get P times Q. Okay. Once, once the volume is... Uh, normalized. Okay. And if you compute the trunk, what you will get is twice the minimum between P and Q. And the reason is that you have the sections, the, the Birkhoff sections, and then you can see things that are passing in the Birkhoff sections. So the, the examples we have done so far, they all have Birkhoff sections. If you take a flow so with a rational slope, yeah. if you take a flow with a rational slope, can you get any 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 you get any, any real number in an interval, probably. Yes, I think, so. yes. So yes. it takes continuous values, no? But the function is continuous. The function is continuous. Constant, so, so it takes infinity yeah. values. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you were trying to ask me if I got algebraic numbers or something. Uh, that's, that was the question. No, you get everything. But, I mean, at least for this example, you get everything. Sorry, I, I was a little bit slow. Okay, yes. No, well, oh, I don't know. I mean, that's that's a big, that's a big thing. This is a Poincaré inequality. So I Cauchy Schwarz with Poincaré inequality. So, so this is in a line. Yes. But here the problem is that you are restricting yourself to one surface. Because. Yeah, so, so we thought at some point that we could say something, but it didn't work out. One inequality is not in the good direction, so it doesn't work out at the end. So that we're, we're stuck with that. Another question? Let's think.